see if this will work. But, uh, it's about an Apollo mission that was not widely publicized. Um, during uh, the uh, episode two, exceptional and unexpected bursts of sunspot activity occurred and two astronauts were exposed to lethal levels of radiation while they were on the lunar surface during a large lunar flare. After they returned to the lunar module, one of them lost consciousness and the other one attempted an emergency ascent back to the command module, but he too lost consciousness and the lunar module crashes onto the lunar surface. Not a happy ending. Is that possible? How much radiation is necessary to cause something that disastrous? That's the topic of today's discussion here. So, just what is radiation? Radiation is essentially just energy traveling through space. And it could be in the form of electromagnetic radiation or particles. And the sources of radiation can be natural or man-made. Radioactive isotopes provide natural background radiation. Medical technology, such as X-ray machines and particle accelerators, can be man-made sources of radiation. Radiation is all around us all the time. In fact, people are radioactive. Why? Because we eat things. We eat things like this, banana. Bananas have a lot of potassium, and potassium has a certain abundance, 120 parts per million, of a radioactive isotope, potassium-40. Potassium-40 is a naturally uh, uh, found radioactive isotope that uh, in a 154-pound average human being might constitute about 16.4 milligrams of uh, all the potassium. If you do the math, you can see it amounts to about 16.4 milligrams of radioactive potassium, amounting to maybe 4,300 disintegrations per second. That is 4.3 kilobecquerel because a becquerel is the unit of disintegration per second. Another source of radiation in the human body is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is a radioisotope that is useful in radiocarbon dating. Now, where does carbon-14 come from? Indirectly, it comes from outer space. So you can see that cosmic rays, specifically uh, um, primary cosmic rays, can form secondary cosmic rays, maybe in the form of neutrons. The neutrons can, in turn, lead to the production of carbon-14 out of nitrogen-14. More specifically, it's what we call an NP reaction. In parentheses up here, you see the particles, the neutron and the proton, surrounded by the elements or radionuclides or um, isotopes here, nitrogen-14 and carbon-14. Basically, a neutron goes in and a proton comes out, and along the way, Nitrogen-14 is converted into radioactive carbon-14. And you can see this happening way up in the atmosphere where collisions between cosmic rays and atmospheric atoms and molecules might produce neutrons. And neutrons then interact with nitrogen-14 to produce carbon-14. Carbon-14 will interact with oxygen to produce radioactive carbon monoxide the carbon monoxide is oxidized into radioactive carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide is taken up by plants in photosynthesis, and then it enters the food chain. That means that all plants are radioactive. And since animals eat these radioactive plants, they become radioactive themselves. The bottom line is that all living plants and animals are naturally radioactive. And carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,730 years, so you can use this as a way of dating material that has, uh, has uh, died. So all living biological materials have about the same ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. That's about one in a trillion. Upon death, the animal or plant no longer takes up any more radiocarbon. And from that point on, the 
carbon-14 is going to decay away with its 5,000 or so year half-life. And we can therefore measure the remaining carbon-14 in the form of the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio and estimate how long ago that organism died. So how much radiation do we get every year from things like carbon-14, potassium-40, and where does this radiation come from? This pie chart from a while back shows that the majority of the natural background radiation comes from radon gas. But as time moved on, you see that yellow portion, the artificial sources, um, becoming more important. And today, the uh, artificial sources, specifically in the form of medical radiation, constitutes about half of our total background radiation. Um, CAT scans and nuclear uh, imaging studies represent the greatest source of medical radiation, but an easy mnemonic for remembering approximately how much we get is maybe one millirem per day. So 365 or so millirem per year. So let's talk about the ABCs of radiation. Radiation is energy traveling through space. But when we talk about radiation like this, we're usually not talking about non-ionizing radiation. We're talking mostly about ionizing radiation. That means that it's capable of knocking electrons off molecules and atoms. Here's a diagram showing the ionizing radiation energy coming in from the left and knocking an electron out and ionizing this atom. Technically, ultraviolet light is ionizing radiation, but historically we separate ionizing radiation from uh, UV light. And uh, today we'll talk about primarily non-UV ionizing radiation. That means instead of talking about ABCs, we should be talking about alpha, betas, and gammas. Alpha particles and beta particles are particulate radiation. Gamma rays, on the other hand, are examples of electromagnetic radiation. And these types of radiation can be so classified because of their ability to penetrate materials. For instance, alpha particles are stopped with just a sheet of paper, but beta particles will pass through that paper, but may be stopped by a sheet of aluminum. Gamma rays, on the other hand, will go right through the paper, right through the aluminum, and some of them even go through a block of lead. Alpha radiation is made of uh, high energy helium nuclei. Here you see uh, excited nucleus emitting an alpha particle, a helium nucleus. And in so doing, that radioactive parent, for example, uranium-238, will transmutate into thorium-234 plus a helium nucleus, an alpha particle, with the release of some energy. In other words, this is alchemy. Maybe you don't get gold out of it, but you do change one element into another. Another example where we use alpha particles is with smoke detectors, which typically have americium 241 in them. And the americium is an alpha source. Alpha radiation is an example of ionizing radiation, and that allows a current to flow from the positive to the negative. Now, in the presence of smoke, smoke will neutralize those ions and open the circuit. An open circuit sends off an alarm, and you know that there's smoke present. In this uh, diagram, we see one of those sexy satellites or uh, spacecraft that get all the attention because of the guys up at the top, the cameras, the spectrometers, the photo polarimeters that bring back all the useful information, the uh, fascinating images, etc. But the guy at the bottom is the one that's doing all the work, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG doesn't get the uh, publicity, but 
deser deserves it because many of them contain plutonium, plutonium 238, which is an alpha emitter with a half-life of about 87 years, which keeps the spacecraft operating for a good long period of time. So these RTGs and RHUs, radioisotope heating units, are really the workhorses. Plutonium-238 oxide can heat up over 700 Fahrenheit, produces 62 watts, and can be converted into electrical energy in the form of an RTG, or it can provide heat for optimal functioning of the electronics in the form of an RHU. Next up would be beta radiation. These are high energy electrons, but instead of orbiting, as in this uh, diagram here, these electrons originate in the nucleus. So as an example, a neutron can convert into a proton emitting an electron or beta particle along with a neutrino, specifically an electron antineutrino. For those who like things in quark, neutron, two down quarks, and up quark, converts one of the down quarks into an up quark to become a proton and an electron and an electron antineutrino are emitted. In terms of a uh, Feynman diagram, you see on the bottom, the two down quarks and one up quark and the neutron converting into a proton, up two up quarks and a down quark, and a W minus particle comes out producing an electron and an electron antineutrino. So beta particles are electrons, which are leptons, and fermions of spin negative one, uh, negative one, a spin of one half and a charge of negative one. We can use them in cancer therapy. For example, we can create monoclonal antibodies directed against cancer. Here's an example of a monoclonal antibody that may be capable of attacking a cancer cell, but is it going to be able to do enough damage on its own? Well, maybe not. How can we strengthen it? Here's how we attach a radionuclide to it. Now, when these antibody molecules are attacking this tumor, they're not just inciting an immunological reaction, but they're also providing radiation that might sterilize this cancer. Another example of the use of beta radiation in medicine is uh, exemplified by beta decay of strontium-90. Strontium-90 decays into yttrium-90 and emits a beta particle. And we could use it to treat pterygium. Pterygium is this web-like growth going across the eye. And you can see that uh, it can grow quite extensive in nature and perhaps encroach upon the pupil, blocking the vision. If you just remove it surgically, 50% of the time it's going to come back. But if you apply some beta radiation in the form of strontium-90 application, um, hold it there for maybe 30 seconds or so, chances are this pterygium is going to be gone forever. All right, so gamma rays and x-rays are electromagnetic radiation. In other words, they're high energy photons. They're capable of ionizing matter. And you can see ionizing radiation is on the far end of this spectrum in the form of ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays, but electromagnetic radiation has a lot of non-ionizing components too, as well, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and visible. Planck's law says that things that have a temperature above absolute zero emit electromagnetic radiation. That limits it to only everything, but Planck's law shows us that the area under these curves increases as a function of temperature and that the peak uh, wavelength um, of the radiation emitted moves to the left as the temperature goes up. That's called Wien's law. Okay, so how do Photons, like gamma rays and x-rays, interact with matter. There are several ways, Rayleigh scattering, Thomson scattering, the photoelectric effect, the Compton effect, or Compton scattering, pair production in which um, high-energy photons may produce 
pairs of matter and antimatter, such as electrons and positrons, or even photonuclear interactions where the photons interact with the nucleus and cause ejection of neutrons and uh, events like that. I'm not going to go into detail here, but uh, just as a bit of trivia, keep in mind that Albert Einstein did not win his Nobel Prize for anything to do with relativity. It had to do with his analysis of the photoelectric effect and how photons or quanta of light are capable of ejecting electrons. So in a sense, Planck and Einstein introduced the quantum theory that he would loathe so much later in his life. Anyway, what are the radiation risks in space? Well, there are several principal source terms, and they are the trapped radiation in the Van Allen belts, galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, or SPEs, and X-rays and gamma rays. The forms of radiation that we might find include free protons, which are hydrogen nuclei, heavier nuclei, free neutrons, all of these are hadrons, and uh, baryonic hadrons, then pions, which are mesons, still hadrons though, and then electrons and muons, which are leptons. X-rays and gamma photons, which are bosons, and then there's some exotic stuff out there like positrons and electrons, uh, positrons and antiprotons. Radiation dose is measured in units of gray or rads. A gray is one joule per kilogram. The biological effect of this radiation is sometimes quantified in terms of sieverts. And uh, like I said before, one way of remembering this is to think that we get about one millirem per day or 360 millirem per year from natural background radiation, which happens to be higher in the mountainous regions and lower in the coastal states. That natural background radiation comes from a variety of sources, like I've said before. Um, maybe some, uh, some radioactivity in the soil and the rocks, which may contain some uranium, some potassium, some thorium, etc. But natural background radiation in the United States ranges from a low of about 131 millirem in Florida to a high of over 960 millirem per year in South Dakota. That's a difference of over 800 millirem per year. But it's interesting to note that there's not a significant health difference between inhabitants of uh, Florida and residents of South Dakota. And it is somewhat instructive to look at the cancer rates in these various states. Maybe radiation at these levels is not as dangerous as we previously believed. In any case, Illinois has about 397 millirem per year. On average, about one millirem per year comes from the carbon-14, and 18 millirem per year comes from the potassium, potassium-40, I should say, that uh, we get from bananas and other sources. Smokers have a little bit more natural background radiation because cigarettes contain polonium-210. That's not why cigarettes are so bad for you, but it doesn't help. But the bottom line, again, is that all people's plants and animals are radioactive. How much radiation do we get and should we get? Well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says that I, as a radiation worker, should get no more than 5,000 millirem per year. A single CAT scan might give 1,000 or 2,000 millirem per shot. And like I said, when we include all the, the background radiation and medical radiation, we now get about 620 millirem per year in the United States. But there are some places that get far more radiation than we get in the United States. Places such as Kerala, India, and Ramsar, Iran are well known. In fact, record level radiations were found in a house in Ramsar where the background radiation from terrestrial sources was over 13,000 millirem, and the radon dose was 7,000 millirem bringing the total up to over 20,000 millirem per year. That's 80 times higher than the world average. The uh, radiation 
Um, source terms again are the radiation in the Van Allen belts, the solar particle events, galactic cosmic rays, and X-rays and gamma rays out there. So let's talk a little bit about the Van Allen belts. These are two giant bagels or donuts of radiation that surround the Earth, and uh, they were discovered by James Van Allen way back in the 50s. In 2012, the Van Allen probes discovered a third belt can transiently appear for a while. And in this illustration, the radiation is in yellow and the cold spots are in green. Here you can see how the radiation might be divided into an inner belt and an outer belt, and that the particles follow these magnetic lines of force and they spiral along these magnetic lines of force from the North Pole to the South Pole and bounce back and forth. Some of you might remember the great movie Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, one of my all-time favorites, but what was it about? As I watched it again recently, the premise is that the Van Allen belts caught fire and the great leader and scientist, Admiral Nelson, has to put the fire out, of course. Um, not an easy task, and maybe not something that he should really have to worry about, because I don't think that the Van Allen belts are likely to catch fire. After all, what is a fire? It's uh, um, a combustion reaction with molecular oxygen and some kind of substance and that substance is not likely to be radiation in the Van Allen belts, and there's no molecular oxygen up there anyway, so I don't think that this is a likely scenario. In any case, we do know that the Van Allen belts are donut-shaped zones of radiation filled with magnetically trapped, highly energetic particles, and they're held in place by the geomagnetic field. They circulate back and forth between the North Pole and the South Pole because our planet can be depicted or modeled as a bar magnet. Incidentally, the geomagnetic North Pole is probably a South Pole, and the South Pole is a North Pole. And additionally, the uh, um, magnetic axis is different from the rotational polar axis by about 12 degrees. Those particles go back and forth, reversing their directions at the poles, because as the particles approach the magnetic poles, the strength of the field causes them to bounce back and forth. This is so called the so-called magnetic mirror effect. And here's an illustration showing the uh, radiation kind of bouncing from one pole to another and spiraling along those magnetic lines of force. Again, uh, another diagram of the inner and outer magnetic uh, um, confined radiation belts. Here's an animation showing those particles spiraling back and forth between North Pole and South Pole regions in the Van Allen belts. And here's a question, why do the Van Allen belts persist? After all, collisions with uh, the atoms in the atmosphere, although not very frequently occurring, will eventually cause those particles to be removed from the belt. And there's not a whole lot of radiation coming in from the sun. However, the particles tend to last for a long time. They survive about 10 years on average. This amounts to a long lifetime that allows particles to accumulate to high levels of radiation in these belts. The radiation is most intense above the equator, and it is effectively absent over the poles. The inner belt uh, goes from 600 miles to 3,000 miles above the surface, and it consists mostly of protons. Some of those protons can be quite energetic, exceeding 30 MeV, maybe up to 700 MeV. That's enough to penetrate four inches of lead. Therefore, spacecraft that are manned or unmanned that fly through the belts have to be protected. Otherwise, the electronic equipment is going to be irreparably damaged. The outer belt is further out, maybe uh, um, 
9,000 miles to uh, 15,000 miles, but sometimes ballooning all the way out to close to 50,000 miles with uh, solar activity. But <clears throat> here, instead of protons, electrons dominate. It's kind of like the arrangement in an atom with the electrons in the outer uh, portion. Now, electrons are also present in the inner belt, but they uh, are lower energy and they're uh, less abundant. And some of the outer belt is derived directly from the solar wind. How do we know that? Because the outer belt contains some helium ions. The inner belt does not contain helium ions. Helium ions or alpha particles account for about 10% of the solar wind, suggesting that the outer belt directly captures some of that solar wind. Now the Van Allen probes, which were launched in 2012 and formally called the Radiation Belt Storm probes, have discovered a lot of great things about the Van Allen, uh, Van Allen belts. The belts are more complicated than we previously believed. The shape of the belt, for example, depends on which particle you're studying. Um, electrons, protons, alpha particles, antiprotons, Depending on, uh, on which particle you investigate, the belt has a different shape. Also, um, intense solar activity sometimes diminishes the outer belt and produces a transient third zone somewhere between the two belts. This was recently discovered. There also seems to be less radiation in certain parts of the, uh, the belt. And if this is true, that means that spacecraft and astronauts might not need to worry so much about uh, traversing the belt if they could find a path through that has less radiation than others. Pre previous to the uh, Van Allen probes discoveries, scientists thought that the inner belts were relatively stable. They are relatively stable compared to the outer belt, but even the inner belt does expand as the sun grows more active. And such expansion can affect the International Space Station and some satellites. Here's the International Space Station, or ISS, quite an amazing structure. It's been inhabited since 2000. Astronauts typically stay up there for about six months at a time. And they are weightless. We've all seen these kinds of uh, uh, videos where people can do some amazing things and have a lot of fun. But this is not because they are so far away from Earth and Earth's gravity. This is because it's in orbit. And by being in orbit, by definition, it is in free fall. In any case, the ISS is about the size of a football field and weighs almost a million pounds. It's orbiting up there around 330 kilometers or 420 kilometers, which is technically in the thermosphere. One thing that's an uh, interesting uh, topic is how much radiation these astronauts are getting from residing there. For example, Scott Kelly lived there for almost a year in 2015. And what's also interesting is that he has a twin brother, Mark Kelly, who's an astronaut, but didn't spend quite as much time up there. Is that radiation exposure hazardous to him? We'll talk about that in a second. So one other bit of interesting type of radiation that's up there in the Van Allen belt, antiprotons. So when primary cosmic rays smash into nuclei of atmospheric molecules, they can create a shower of different particles, exotic particles, some antiprotons. How does that happen? Well, when primary cosmic rays smack into atmospheric atoms and molecules, which is a process called spallation, neutrons and antineutrons can be produced. Antineutrons can escape the atmosphere move up and decay into antiprotons and wind up in the inner Van Allen belt. The PAMELA detector, which is an acronym for this, has found this self-renewing source of antiprotons in the inner Van Allen belt. But actually, PAMELA only discovered a few dozen antiprotons. 
not a heck of a lot, but it was enough to confirm the theory. Importantly, these antiprotons were discovered over the South Atlantic anomaly. This is a part of the Van Allen belt where it dips closest to the Earth's surface. You can see it located over Brazil and the South Atlantic Ocean. And this is the part of the um, Van Allen belt that has the greatest fluence of trapped particles at low altitude. At 370 kilometers, where uh, uh, the uh, ISS does uh, travel, proton fluence for protons in this energy range are a thousand times higher than other areas at the same height. That means that uh, um, on average, inhabitants of the space station get about 50 millirem per day. Newer estimates are about half of that, but a full year might yield about 18,000 millirem per year, maybe according to newer estimates, maybe eight to 9,000 millirem per year, with most of that, or at least half of it coming from being over the South Atlantic anomaly. These doses, while very high, apparently, are still comparable to doses that people get naturally here on, on Earth in Ramsar or in Kalala. And it might amount to getting uh, four to seven PET CT scans in the morning. So I said that the radiation source terms include the radiation in Van Allen belts. That's mostly protons and electrons from the sun. And uh, they may have up to several hundred MeV, which are units of energy, millions of electron volts in energy. And they have a linear energy transport or LET of 0.25 to 10 keV per micron. That's low LET. Solar particle events, or SPEs, are also low LET. They're also mostly protons and uh, some alpha particles. <clears throat> and there may be several hundred MeV of uh, um, e energy. Um, galactic cosmic rays, on the other hand, also are made of protons and alpha particles, but contain heavier nuclei. They come from beyond our solar system, maybe some from beyond our galaxy. And they're up to several thousand MeV in energy. This puts them in the high LET category. So there's a special subset of galactic cosmic rays called HZEs. They have high Z or atomic number and high E or energy. These are nuclei that range from helium to iron and even heavier, all the way up to Z equals 92 or uranium. They're so energetic that spacecraft shielding is of limited value. And they are possibly the most uh, biologically damaging. They do have high LET and high RBE or relative biological effectiveness. RBE, relative biological effectiveness, depends to some extent on the type of radiation you're dealing with. And specifically, high LET, which um, is linear energy transfer, but to a, a physicist, it's DEDX, the amount of energy per track length. Uh, depends on whether you're bio looking at it from a biology perspective or from a physics perspective. Either way, it's the same mathematical. EDX. High LET radiation usually has high RBE. And what is the target of this radiation? Well, at least in cancer therapy, radiation therapy, we're looking at um, DNA as the molecular target. So when we use radiation therapy to eliminate a cancerous tumor, we're targeting that cancerous tumor's cell's DNA molecules. But when we do this, not all radiation is equally damaging. For example, this X-ray at the top is sparsely ionizing, and you see this ionizing event here might not even be breaking the DNA strand. On the other hand, this heavy ion track from a cosmic ray, for example, 
is causing double-strand DNA break. Cosmic rays, neutrons, and alpha particles are more likely to cause double-strand DNA breaks. Double-strand DNA breaks are more difficult to repair than single-strand DNA breaks. And it seems that there is an LET optimum. The linear energy transfer is most biologically effective when it is 100 keV per micron. At 10 keV per micron or less, like x-rays, the ionization, these blue blobs here, are so sparsely spaced out that a single strand break is more likely than a double strand break. But high LET radiation, specifically when it's 100 keV per micron, seems to have ionizing events 20 angstroms apart. And that corresponds with the diameter of the double helix molecule. Thus, alpha particles and anything at 100 keV per micron seems to be most effective. Single strand DNA breaks, easy to repair. Cancer resistance is likely. But with alpha radiation, double strand DNA breaks are the rule. Resistance is futile. This cancer is doomed. So getting back to the radiation in space, that radiation in the Van Allen belts is important for astronauts in low Earth orbit, but it's relatively constant. Solar particle events are important for missions that are beyond the magnetosphere, but it's not constant. It's sporadic and unpredictable, more likely to occur at solar maximum, but still not perfectly predictable. Galactic cosmic rays are also important for missions beyond the magnetosphere, and they are relatively constant as well, but they might vary from time to time with rare events such as supernovas. NCRP 132 tells us about radiation risks to astronauts in low Earth orbit, but beyond low Earth orbit, the risks magnify. In fact, it's estimated that for each week spent beyond the magnetosphere, there's a um, high chance of receiving a lethal dose from a solar flare or um, coronal mass ejection. Missions lasting two years might correspond to a 20% chance of a lethal dose. And that means that we need better shielding or some form of better biological protection. So let's talk about LEO first. Uh, there are various definitions for low Earth orbit, maybe an altitude of 1,200 miles, maybe one third of the Earth's radius. The pull of gravity is only slightly less than that on Earth's surface, and that's why um, the astronauts who um, seem to be uh, floating are not floating because of the loss of gravity, but because they are in free fall. That's demonstrated by Newton's canon. You might remember this from uh, college physics, that as an object goes faster, it can reach further and further. And eventually, it might go so fast that it can reach into orbit around the planet. Now, if it's going too fast, it might exceed escape velocity, 11.2 kilometers um, per second here on Earth. But we don't want satellites to go that fast. We want them to reach a specific speed for each orbit. And what is the speed? I'll allow uh, some of you who are interested in, uh, in physics to calculate the velocity by setting Newton's law of universal gravitation equal to the centripetal force uh, mv squared over r and solve for v, and you should come up with this, which tells you how fast a satellite will be moving for its given radius. But it amounts to Kepler's third law, which is that the period squared is equal to the radius cubed. Satellites that are further up are going to travel slower than lower orbiting satellites. The uh, ISS is in low Earth orbit, maybe 250 miles above the Earth's surface, and goes about 17,000 miles per hour. Objects that are further up there in geosynchronous orbit are going to have to go about 7,000 miles an hour to stay there. And the moon, as far as it is away from us, 
only travels about 2,300 miles per hour. So here's an example of something that's in a geosynchronous orbit, meaning that it's taking a lap around the planet every 24 hours and uh, um, is matching the pace of Earth's rotation. This can occur at an altitude of 22,000 miles or so. To maintain an uh, orbit of 22,000 miles, you have to be going about 7,000 miles an hour. Geostationary orbit is a special subtype of geosynchronous orbit that only works at the equator. And since it only works at the equator, that means that it's getting kind of crowded up there. There's standing room only at this point. And as you might imagine, as time goes on, it's going to get more and more crowded up there. That leads to this concept of the Kessler syndrome. Not sure if people have heard about this, but it's a theoretical scenario due to overcrowding where the density reaches a critical point where if something goes wrong and one of them were to break up, it could lead to a runaway cascade, a chain reaction analogous to what happens to supracritical um, masses of, um, of U-235, for example. So each collision is going to generate more debris and that's going to increase more collisions. So if something like this were to happen in a super dense environment of satellites, Kessler syndrome might ensue and everything goes to, to smithereens. So satellites are orbiting in heights of hundreds of kilometers to hundreds of thousands of kilometers. The Iridium satellite constellation, for example, is uh, 66 satellites up there in low Earth orbit and travels about 100 minutes per orbit, um, making about 14 laps per day. Middle Earth orbit is where um, a lot of the GPS satellites are, and they circulate circle around Earth about twice a day and geostationary orbit is higher still. Um, middle or medium Earth orbit is above low Earth orbit, but below geosynchronous orbit and beyond geosynchronous orbit, we call it high Earth orbit, beyond 22,000 miles. The um, orbital periods of satellites in high Earth orbit are more than 24 hours. Therefore, it's going to look like they're going backwards. They have an apparent retrograde um, motion. Now, I show this uh, diagram because this is where the Van Allen belts are in relationship to low Earth orbit, middle Earth orbit, and geosynchronous orbit. And there are some no-fly zones out there. Though. So what are we going to do about all this radiation? Shielding can block out much of the radiation from the Van Allen belts and the solar particle events. It might be prudent to travel through the Van Allen belts quick as possible um, to avoid a long time there. And the selection of trajectories is very important. Maybe uh, you want to head out through the poles because there's less radiation up there. Additionally, scheduling might be important. Avoiding traveling at solar max, for example. Here is a cutaway diagram showing the internal anatomy of our sun. And the important component right now is the corona, which surrounds the, uh, the chromosphere and is visible during eclipses. Here's a photograph during the, uh, the last solar eclipse showing the corona. Now the corona contains highly ionized atoms and emits a lot of X-rays. It eventually merges with the solar wind and uh, the corona is where coronal mass ejections originate, of course. In this um, animation, you can see the corona merging with the solar wind, which is flying away on the right. And the solar wind is flying away at a speed of about 1,000 uh, kilometers per second, or 2 million miles an hour. Now, solar eruptions include three types, solar prominences, solar flares, and coronal mass ejections projection in order of increasing uh, potency. Solar prominences, yeah, they're, they're explosions, but they usually are pulled back down by um, sun's gravity. Now, um, solar flares can escape, and maybe they could um, cause trouble if they're headed our direction. 
coronal mass ejections like this one at the 10 o'clock position can be almost as large in area as the sun itself. And sometimes they can be even larger than the sun's area. If it's headed our way, we could be in for some trouble. The solar radiation is mostly protons and alpha particles with some uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. They last for about one to four days. Turns out that there's 11, up to 11 significant solar flares headed our way each year, but we can't predict exactly when they're going to occur. But we do know that they're more likely to occur during solar max when the sunspots are most prevalent. So that uncertainty leads to concerns for astronauts' health. And it estimated that a direct hit from a powerful solar particle event during solar max can deliver a dose of over three gray. That's a very significant dose. How do we know that? Because there are three radiation syndromes, acute radiation syndromes. The hematopoietic or bone marrow syndrome occurs at doses over 700 centigrade, and the LD5060, which is the lethal dose to 50% of the people within 60 days, is somewhere between three and five gray. But death occurs a few months after exposure, not within days or hours. On the other hand, the GI or gastrointestinal syndrome occurs with doses more than 10 gray or 1,000 rad. Sur survival is unlikely with this kind of dose, but the death occurs not within uh, months, but often within weeks. Now, the worst is due to a huge dose of 50 gray or more, and symptoms of uh, seizures and coma can occur within hours and it is uniformly fatal. Death occurs within three days. This is not likely to have happened on the moon. So I think that uh, Mishner's book, while very interesting and uh, alerting us to some of the hazards of radiation in space, might uh, be a little bit of an exaggeration. What do you do if you're exposed to this radiation? Well, if it's iodine-131, you might be able to take um, potassium iodine, Lugol solution, to block up all the sites in the thyroid. Um, if you were exposed to cesium or thallium, Prussian blue might be something that can complex to the um, radioactive uh, materials and get excreted in the feces. If you were exposed to plutonium, you might uh, take DTPA, which um, chelates the uh, um, metal and is excreted in the urine. Now, what if the radiation is not in the form of something ingested, a radioactive isotope, but is in the form of gamma rays that you've been blasted with? There are a couple of drugs, Phil Grastim uh, is an example. These drugs stimulate white blood cell production and they could prevent death by warding off infection because uh, you don't lose all your white blood cells. So it might save some people from dying from the hematopoietic syndrome. Um, blood transfusion, platelet transfusion might also save some of these people. So basically you should not die from doses of five gray and less. But if you get up there, eight gray, 10 gray, and you get the GI syndrome or the CMS syndrome, unfortunately there is nothing right now that we can do to cure those people. But here are a couple of agents that might be worth considering. The first one is called amifostine. The second one is uh, WR, stands for Walter Reed, WR1065. These are agents that were developed by the Army as radiation mitigators. And the common thread here is that they contain sulfur. And in their active form, they have sulfhydryl groups. Sulfhydryl groups, are found in all of these different uh, agents, amiphosteine, glutathione, MEA, and acetylcysteine, which incidentally is the treatment of an overdose of um, Tylenol, because Tylenol is gonna produce free radicals that destroy the liver. All of these agents have free radical scavenging sulfhydryl groups, and free radicals are 
responsible for about 65% of the damage caused by low LET ionizing radiation. Well, let's take a look at the, the sunspot situation again. These are blemishes on the photosphere. Now they're still hot and they're still producing a lot of light, but they just look dark because they are cool relative to the, uh, the background. They vary from zero to hundreds at any given time. But sunspots are associated with an increase of overall solar activity, increased in solar flares and coronal mass ejection, and they're most prevalent during solar maximum. And solar maximum, solar minimum, they go in the um, cycles of about 11 years from maximum to maximum. And you can see how solar irradiance measured in watts per meter squared correlates nicely with sunspot activity. And the number of sunspots varies from cycle to cycle. Interestingly, there's an inverse relationship between sunspot count and galactic cosmic ray bombardment here on the surface. There were periods when there were a paucity of sunspots lasting for many decades. Two examples are the Maunder minimum and the Dalton minimum. And during these periods, there were very few sunspots. That means that because of this inverse relationship between sunspots and galactic cosmic rays, there were probably um, increased cosmic rays during these um, global solar minima. Why is that? Because sunspots mean more solar activity. More solar activity means more prominences, flares, and uh, stronger solar wind. This deflects the bad guys. The bad guys here are cosmic rays when it comes to the climate. So you can see in this diagram at the top here, a weak solar magnetic field does not mitigate the cosmic rays coming in. They come in full speed and full force. On the other hand, this smiling sun with sunspots has a strong solar magnetic field and is able to ward off the cosmic rays. Um, I was going to put something here, but I'll just say it that uh, uh, the reason this works is because cosmic rays are believed to serve as cloud nucleation um, uh, stimuli. So more cosmic rays, more clouds, more clouds, more albedo, more reflection of sunlight and a lowering of the temperature. More clouds also mean uh, increased rain and snowfall. More snow on the ground also increases reflection, increased libido. So the bottom line is the climate might change for the worse. And it seems that Absence of sunspots does seem to correlate with things like the Little Ice Age. And abundance of sunspots seems to correlate with the medieval uh, warm period. So there might be something to this. The Little Ice Age spanned from 1300 to 1850, and uh, there were some times where it was quite chilly, and the artists depict these times. This is not how I think of the south of France, but this is the way it was back then. This is also not how I envision Rome, but this is the way it was back in those days. The Thames rarely freezes now, but it did so regularly um, during the Little Ice Age. And a lot of these artistic descriptions um, um, confirm the uh, uh, stories of it being cold. In fact, the story of Hansel and Gretel might have some truth to it because of all the crop failures during this especially cold period and the famines that ensued. Um, the grim fairy tales might have had some uh, factual basis. Well, moving on to the galactic cosmic rays, I'll just say that they vary um, from time to time with events such as supernova. And uh, I'll skip through some of this in the interest of time. Um, the crew in the low Earth orbit, like in the um, ISS, are not exposed to the full repertoire of galactic cosmic rays. That's because of geomagnetic deflection. Our atmosphere protects us down here on the surface, but that's not going to be the case if you get up there beyond our magnetosphere and beyond our atmosphere. Out on the moon, we're 
and during interplanetary missions to Mars, to J the Jovian satellites, to uh, Titan and around uh, Saturn, uh, you're going to be exposed to the full force of the galactic cosmic rays. Where do these things come from in the first place? Well, where they come from remains a mystery, and uh, it seems likely that they're related to a supernova blazing in from all over the place. Supernovas um, will fire these galactic cosmic rays in our direction, and they are the uh, remnants of an exploding, uh, or the, that they are the explosion of a, a supermassive uh, star, and they can outshine an entire galaxy might occur once per century in a typical galaxy. Um, and these cosmic rays can be categorized as primary or secondary. Primary cosmic rays are the ones that come right from outer space or from the sun. Secondary cosmic rays like pions, muons, and neutrons are those that are produced in the atmosphere. For example, free neutrons that uh, um, are created by collisions with nuclei in the um, uh, atmosphere producing carbon-14. So we're being blasted with uh, secondary um, cosmic rays all the time. Pions and muons are part of a cosmic ray cascade. How do we get hit with 10,000 muons uh, per minute? Because Muons don't live that long. Muons have a very, very short half-life. In fact, they shouldn't make it to the surface because they uh, have a half-life that's only 1.56 microseconds. If you do the math, they should only go about 500 meters, maybe a quarter mile, even if they're going at the speed of light. So how is it that you get one muon per square centimeter um, here on the surface? Well, this is because muons prove the special theory of relativity. Time slows down for things that are going that fast. Time dilation occurs. So instead of living just 1.5 seconds, these muons live much, much longer. You can do the math here and show that uh, how long a muon might live. In fact, if uh, you substitute V with something that is faster than C, you can see that you get a negative number. Time will go backwards. Time will be negative. And things that do that are called tachyons. Um, this is a joke about tachyons, supposed to be very funny. Um, anyway, are those secondary cosmic rays useful in any way? Well, I'd say that they were. Um, for example, uh, there's this thing called the Scan Pyramids Project using muon tomography, muon radiography. And basically, it is taking an x-ray, but not with x-ray, um, it's taking an x-ray of the pyramid using muons. And the muons are coming from outer space in the northeast here. And by reconstructing what's, uh, what's going, going on inside, you can see that there's something called a big void, maybe another uh, chamber in the, uh, the Great Pyramid. We do the same thing with protons, and uh, that's how we create these images of um, fish and humans using proton radiography. Well, cosmic rays can also cause problems. Uh, one of them was the Carrington event of 1859, the solar storm of 1859. On September 1st, the monstrous solar flare, or, or CME, induced the largest geomagnetic storm on record, so-called Carrington event. It caused intense aurora. They could be seen all the way down to the Caribbean. People could read the newspaper by the light of the aurora. If something like that happened today, it could really wreak havoc. I'm going to skip through this section about the thermosphere um, and uh, the ionosphere, but I'll just say that the ionosphere is where the aurora borealis occurs. And uh, that's because of these ions in the atmosphere that are caused by radiation being channeled uh, to the uh, northern and southern polar regions. Um, it's caused by radiation from the Van Allen belts being shuttled back and forth between the north and south poles and interacting with um, molecules in the atmosphere, causing their ionization, 
and upon recombination, light comes out. And that light could be red or green, depending on whether it's oxygen or nitrogen, depending on what energy um, was involved in the uh, transition. Now, Earth is not the only place with auroras. The uh, um, auroras can also be found on Saturn, and they can be seen on Jupiter. Actually, they can't be seen with the naked eye because the auroras on Jupiter are in the ultraviolet and X-ray portions of our spectrum. Well, we talked about how going fast can um, slow time down. So you're probably familiar with the twin paradox where a pair of twins uh, exist. One goes away on a space uh, mission and is traveling close to the speed of light. When he comes back, he has aged less than the twin who has stayed home. Well, that's the classic twin paradox. But here's a biological, a radiobiological twin paradox involving Scott and Mark Kelly. They're twin astronauts, but Scott has spent a great deal of time in outer space, uh, nearly a year on the International Space Station. When he came back, people wondered what kind of cytogenetic effects his cells might exhibit. It turns out that his telomeres were longer, not shorter, than his twin brother. This is a paradox because telomeres are cellular timekeepers. Each time a cell divides, its telomere gets shortened a little bit. So the telomeres of an 80-year-old are much shorter than the telomeres of an 8-year-old. After the telomeres have gotten too short, the cell can no longer divide. The cell enters senescence and eventually dies. Radiation from outer space would have been predicted to shorten telomeres, but in fact, it was the opposite. Um, Interestingly, this effect was only transient. I'm going to finish up by talking about uh, extinctions, mass extinctions. Well, we all know what killed the dinosaurs, but uh, um, could there be other things that cause mass extinctions? Yeah, maybe. For example, um, what about the Milky Way theory? The galaxy rotates once every 225 million years. And the galaxy is not perfectly flat. It has a definite thickness. There's an invisible line going through the galaxy that we call the galactic plane. Notice that the solar system is tilted relative to the galactic plane. But it doesn't, we don't travel around in a straight line. We travel in a sine wave, a sinusoidal pattern. And that means that there are times when we're above the plane and times we're below the plane. Right now, we're pretty close to the, uh, the plane itself, but every, uh, uh, 62 million years, we will be at uh, maximum amplitude, either above or below that plane of our galaxy. What might happen? Well, according to Professor Malat, excursions to galactic north coincide with drops in biodiversity. In other words, mass extinctions. Why? You guessed it, because of cosmic rays. It's believed that when we are too far from the galactic plane, we are out of the magnetic shielding of the galactic plane, and we're going to be blasted with higher levels of cosmic radiation. So far, there's no proof for these cosmic rays from hell, um, but it does lead us to speculate about what might happen if we were to have a perfect storm where our atmosphere would fail us, or our geomagnetic shielding may be compromised. For example, during a geomagnetic reversal where North Pole becomes South Pole and vice versa, our magnetic field declines, our shield is diminished. And what, we're, what if that were to coincide with a longer minimum where there's a reduction in the solar wind? And what if a star that were nearby were to go supernova at the same time? I think that could be a perfect storm for something really bad. What about a gamma ray burst? That uh, is another potentially bad situation. A focus on the long duration gamma ray bursts that are caused by hypernova in the interest of time here. Hypernova um, form black holes and 
when a black hole is formed, it's associated with the uh, gamma ray burst. The gamma ray burst is caused by jets of plasma which shoot out in opposite directions. So the birth of a black hole somewhere might be linked to the death of a lot of life at the end of the Ordovician period, 444 million years ago. And uh, if one of those gamma ray burst plasma that are caused by jets of plasma were to be aimed right at us, that could uh, spell doom and destruction because um, it could uh, damage our um, ozone layer. Is there one that might uh, be potentially hazardous for us? This one, R136A1, is the most massive known star, and it is probably going to go hypernova. But it's uh, not pointed in our direction and not in our vicinity. There is one called Wolf Rayet 104 that is possibly aiming our direction and is only 8,000 light years away. What if it were aimed right at us? Well, most people say it's really not aimed at us, but it is interesting that it's in the uh, constellation Sagittarius, and who knows just how good the archer's aim is going to be. If it were to provide a direct hit, our ozone layer would be diminished, and ultraviolet light would come raining in and cause trouble, because UV light is filtered out by the stratospheric ozone specifically UVC, which is highly damaging to biology. Most of the UVB is also filtered out. In the Ordovician, there were no land animals, thank goodness. They would have been devastated. But uh, um, planktonic forms and sea life that has a planktonic larval form would have been wiped out because of this, uh, if it really happened, and could have left um, a whole generation eradicated, precipitating the extinction of many species. Now, that's all hypothetical, but we know factually what happens when we're exposed to a lot of gamma rays, and uh, it's uh, more of a positive than a negative here. And at this point, I guess I'll just sign off and say uh, that's all, folks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, but I wanted to stop and see if anyone has any questions if you can raise your hand um and see if anyone has any questions before we go to what's in the chat you can also unmute yourself if you like Okay, so the first question in the chat is, uh, where do we get carbon-12 from? Where do we get carbon-12 from then as the ratio is around 1.25 trillion? So where do we get the 1.25 of carbon-12 from? Okay, so um, let me clarify. There's 1.25 carbon-14 for every trillion carbon-12. Now, carbon-14 is radioactive. It is not stable. On the other hand, carbon-12 is stable. So what we had from the beginning is what we have now. There's another stable isotope, carbon-13, which um, also uh, helps us in certain ways when we look at the so-called uh, delta-13C to figure out what might have happened in terms of uh, biodiversity uh, uh, changes and uh, climatic changes, things of that sort. But uh, um, let me make it clear that carbon-12 is and always was. It's a stable isotope. Carbon-14 is changing, and it comes from the interaction of cosmic rays with molecules in the atmosphere. So the, the carbon-14 will change from time to time, but the carbon-12 is constant and always will be constant. I hope that explains it. Uh, next question was, do antiprotons have quarks? Interesting question. So if we say that a, a proton is made out of a up, up, and a down quark, well, 
um, antiproton would be an anti-up, anti-up, and an anti-down quark. Um, mesons, remember, are examples of hadrons, um, which are anything made out of quarks. Hadrons include mesons and baryons, but mesons are quark anti-quark pairs. So the answer is yes, antiprotons have anti-quarks. Let's see, in 2017, NASA proposed the idea of positioning a magnetic dipole shield at the Sun, Mars, Lagrange point one for use as an artificial magnetosphere for Mars. The idea is that this would protect the planet's atmosphere from the sun, radiation, and solar winds. Do you know if this is plausible? Well, it sounds like a great idea, and theoretically, it might be plausible. And when you think about it, if we were to go up there, try to terraform Mars and produce an oxygen atmosphere, only to have the solar wind blow it away, we would be very sad. So uh, I think that anything that would preserve the uh, newly created atmosphere would be worthwhile. And this sounds theoretically possible. Nevertheless, uh, whether it's plausible technologically is another question. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, this one might be beyond our, our grasp right now. Is NASA currently researching possibilities and costs? Um, I'm sure people are estimating it. And I bet you that estimate is that it's going to cost a lot. Um, where can I find additional information? Well, uh, the best source might be at the, uh, the NASA website. Uh, there's always something new um, on these NASA websites, and uh, um, that would probably be the place to look at uh, for updates on this. Perhaps the Mars atmosphere can begin regeneration with such a satellite? Um, yes. If we were to terraform Mars and start to introduce more oxygen, maybe um, get plants to produce um, um, oxygen from the carbon dioxide that is up there and maybe create a thicker atmosphere, we wouldn't want it to just get blown away by the solar wind. So it really is worth, uh, worth considering. And maybe this consideration is one of the, uh, the ideas that could uh, preserve such an atmosphere. Let's see, the next question is, in relation to the previous question about the dipole shield, do you think small amounts of radiation can help to power that sort of device, almost like an Earth solar panel? I think that's a great question. Um, many um, spacecrafts are powered by solar power. Many are powered by RTGs, but one interesting comparison was the difference between, um, I think, opportunity and uh, curiosity. Um, I think uh, one of them was knocked out of commission by the uh, Martian windstorms and the dust because that one had a solar panel on it and is out of commission. Um, whereas uh, I think curiosity is still going because it was nuclear powered. So um, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe a nuclear powered device could, uh, could keep things going. But uh, if you're away from the Martian dust, solar might work well too. But if you're going way out there, um, like Cassini to Saturn and uh, uh, New Horizons out to Pluto, you're not gonna have enough sunlight to keep you going. You might depend on something that's uh, more, more reliable, like the uh, nuclear uh, energy from plutonium-238. Uh, okay, um, is there potential to add a similar dipole magnet satellite at Earth's L1 for additional pre protection from extreme solar events? Well, um, I guess uh, I should have explained what a Lagrange point is how uh, there might be uh, an equivalent um, gravitational interaction between various um, 
um, celestial bodies, the earth, the moon, the sun, so that there's a, a point where um, the orbit is stable. Those are the so-called Lagrange points. And uh, it might be a great idea to have something like uh, these dipole magnetic satellites to protect things like Mars or, or the, uh, the moon. But frankly, we probably don't need that here on Earth, thanks to our magnetosphere and thanks to our atmosphere. But like I said, there are times when our magnetosphere is going to go down. When the North Pole and the South Pole change places during a geomagnetic reversal, the geomagnetic field strength is going to be diminished, uh, maybe 90%. Perhaps at that time, we might benefit from something like this if such technology can be developed and, uh, and uh, is in place uh, at that time. But uh, for the time being, we really don't need something like that. Thanks to our atmosphere and magnetosphere. Let's see. Tachyon is a hypothetical particle. They couldn't exist in this universe. Well, according to the math, that's correct. Um, you can't have, uh, um, have something going faster than the speed of light because um, uh, it just wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. It is hypothetical. Um, and as far as we know, there is nothing that goes faster than the speed of light. I remember driving through Fermilab a few years ago when scientists um, from Italy did some work at CERN and said that they had discovered neutrinos that were going faster than the speed of light. In other words, they had discovered tachyons. The uh, speed limit sign, which typically says 40 miles per hour, was crossed out and said, tachyons may exceed C, but you must still drive less than 40 miles per hour. Um, so Italian neutrinos maybe uh, um, were reportedly going faster than the speed of light. Now it's kind of doubtful that they were true tachyons. And uh, um, to this point, I don't think any tachyons have been confirmed. Okay, next question. If I were going on a deep space voyage, would you suggest that I move to Ramsar? for my body to build a radiation tolerance or move to Florida to minimize my body's exposure? Well, uh, that's a great question. And uh, nobody knows the, uh, the answer. But one idea might be that you go to Florida and now you've saved all your reserves so that when you're in outer space, you've got all these reserves left and you haven't burned up your, uh, your supply of, of radiation resistance interesting hypothesis, but I don't think it's correct. If I were to, uh, to uh, bet on one or the other, I would probably go to Ramsar, Iran. Why? Because there you're getting amounts of radiation that are comparable to what you would get in outer space, and chronic exposure might induce what's called an adaptive response. The adaptive response is biologically mediated by a variety of different things, including the induction of more enzymes that repair DNA. As an example, um, a molecule called ATM for uh, the uh, genetic syndrome, ataxia telangiectasia, is induced with radiation. ATM levels go up when you're exposed to radiation, but one thing that's interesting is that the ATM levels, which are responsible for repairing DNA and cleaning up the damage from radiation damage, these ATM levels rise even when the radiation has not damaged the DNA. So what happens is that you get some radiation exposure, but it induces um, ATM, but it has not damaged the DNA. So what's the ATM gonna do? It's gonna fix the DNA that has been broken from other causes. We all breathe oxygen. Oxygen produces ROS, reactive oxygen species, that cause damage to the DNA. So every day we're developing mutations just by breathing oxygen. Well, radiation might induce levels of ATM that actually go beyond repairing the DNA damage from the radiation alone and repair the DNA damage that is induced by just living here and being um, um, aerobically respiring. So in fact, 
I would bet on going to Ramsar to get that radiation exposure, induce the adaptive response, induce a so-called hermetic response, and uh, then hightail it to outer space. Nobody knows the truth right now, but I might also pack, pack some amiphosteine or some other compounds that have sulfhydryl groups while I'm up there in space. Uh, next question is, I've heard of an astronaut on the ISS sleeping with water bottles around his head to help mitigate radiation exposure. Cool. What are the newest radiation shield ideas for spacecraft, lining the walls with water, etc.? Yes, um, bottles might be an old school way of doing it, but now there are probably more sophisticated um, shielding uh, methods available. And one of the ways that you could test whether it's working or not is by seeing whether you see these so-called phosphenes or light flashes that astronauts uh, uh, frequently report. These light flashes are supposedly occurring when cosmic rays are going through the eye or maybe going through the part of the brain that, uh, that uh, is associated with vision in the posterior occipital portion of the brain and uh, um, triggering these, these uh, sensations of light, whether it's caused by activation of the retina, activation of the retinal, um, the, the optic nerve, activation of the occipital lobe, or by Serenkov or Serenkov radiation in the vitreous humor, nobody knows. But the fact is that these astronauts do report seeing these light flashes. And if you surround your head by these bottles, maybe you see less flashes of light. If that works, then I think it might make sense to try to develop something more sophisticated, uh, such as lining the walls um, with water, et cetera. So I bet you that would work. Um, we should ask one of the, uh, the inhabitants of the, uh, the, the ISS whether or not uh, this does work and they see less of these light flashes because some people say that they can bother you while you're trying to sleep. Uh, did I hear correctly that Scott Kelly's telomere lengthening was only a transient temporary effect? Yes, that is true. And I don't know why it would be that they were longer than Mark Kelly's but then shortened back to uh, the expected length uh, um, shortly thereafter. That's a mystery. So that twin paradox is quite confusing. But yes, it is true that Scott Kelly's telomeres were longer um, upon his return than his twin brother, but then they, uh, they um, um, shortened back to the expected length thereafter. Uh, can you quantify the difference between telomere length between Scott and his, his twin? Actually, no, I don't have all the data to, uh, to do this. I've written one paper on the subject, but I need to get, the, uh, uh, get more detailed information to, so that we can quantify it and see what percentage of, of biological or cytogenetic effects are long-lasting and, uh, and how significant they were. I think about 6% of the changes um, in gene expression might be uh, long lasting, but uh, I can't provide anything more quantitative than that. Another clarification in books, it is written that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, but why? Well, the simple answers are that, well, that, that's Einstein's postulate um, and uh, uh, when you look at the Lorentz contraction equations, you can see things like the mass increasing as you go faster and faster, and the length decreasing as you go faster and faster. And when V equals C, the length becomes zero, the mass becomes infinite, time goes to zero. But that's uh, just a simple way of saying, well, the math says it, it's impossible to, to go faster than the speed of light or to ever reach the speed of light because after all, acceleration um, requires force by Newton's second law, F equals MA. And if the mass keeps increasing, that means to increase the acceleration and go faster, um, you are gonna have to apply more force. And as V approaches C, the force would approach infinity. 
And so there are a lot of uh, mathematical reasons, but uh, that's a long winded way of saying, I don't know, I uh, don't know why uh, it would be a rule saying that uh, you really can't go. The math works out that way. And like we said before, if you just uh, plug the math in and put in numbers that exceed C, now you have things that are going faster than the speed of light. The length becomes negative. The mass um, uh, becomes infinite, beyond infinite. Um, the uh, um, the time goes backwards. So a lot of weird things might happen if you were to actually reach the speed of light or exceed it. Um, let's see, there's another question going back to the idea of shielding. I remember reading that graphene is a potential near material for future shielding due to the fact that it's carbon based. However, since it's a single layer, how well would that work? Hmm. Well, you know, I, frankly, I'd have to go back and start uh, looking at some of the cross sections between um, various uh, allotropes of carbon. Diamond is an allotrope uh, of carbon. Graph graphite is an allotrope of carbon. Buckyballs are, are um, allotropes of carbon. When the carbon is arranged in uh, graphene, would it um, be more likely to interact with um, ionizing radiation and provide better shielding? My gut reaction is probably not, but uh, um, frankly, I, I'm not quite so sure about that. So I have to, uh, have to, have to think about that one and, and look into it a little bit further. You might have stumped me on that. Well, I don't know. Are there any other questions? Amanda, do you see any more? Looks like one more oops. Oh. One oh. more popped in, in the chat. Yeah. Well, and we'll um this will be our last question. Um and we'll wrap up after this one. Okay. Do you think that this is a base reality or is this a simulation? Not quite sure what that, that's about. Uh, um I'm gonna assume that it's regarding the uh, um the Martian base. And I do think that uh, uh, a Mars um, base is quite possible. We can come up with shielding that would protect us from the radiation. We could take advantage of certain natural structures like lava tubes, which are like caverns that uh, we could um, find refuge from radiation if we know that there's gonna be a solar particle event. We are getting better technology so that we can tell when a solar particle event is coming. After all, it takes eight minutes for light to get from the um, sun to the earth. Maybe it takes longer, of course, to get from the sun to Mars, but that means that uh, you'll have some warning that the particles are on their way. And if you have enough um, advanced warning, you can seek shelter, or maybe you can take the medicine, the amiphostine or um, glutathione or something like that. So um, I think that uh, a Martian base or even a lunar base is a definite reality and it is something that's coming in our future. Okay. So right. that, that concludes our talk, The Sky's the Limit, Radiation Hazards of Space Travel. I want to thank all of you for joining us and I want to thank Dr. Welsh for giving this lecture and answering our questions. Um, I hope to see you all at future sessions of the Summer Science Series. Um, you can find more information. You can follow us on Twitter at Fermilab Ed, on Facebook, or on our website at ed.fnal.gov. The next talk is scheduled for June 28th. So thank you all and have a great day. Yes, thank you, Amanda. Thanks, everybody. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>